Right. Well, without any further ado, I think we're going to get started. So uh, the first session, we have a few sessions for you, but the first session is about coronary artery disease risk. And I know uh, you're not thinking about only your patients that you serve, but I know many of you think about yourself, about risk, and how do you bring down risk? How do you identify it? And I think it's great because coronary disease, not necessarily valvular disease, but other diseases, quite a few of them are preventable. And I think when you discuss things with patients, when you discuss things with your relatives and your friends, uh, I think it would be great to have you informed regarding risk. And I think to start us off will be detection of coronary disease before it strikes. And this is Dr. Faisal Nabi, one of our faculty. He is uh, uh, associate director of the cardiac MRI laboratory and uh, he's really one of the people who are you know, specialized in all areas of imaging, and imaging is, is essential also as part of detection. So Faisal, it's great to have you and to start our off. Thank you. A very good morning to everyone. It's very nice seeing all of y'all. Thank you, Dr. Shah, Dr. Zogby, for the opportunity to speak to y'all today. So I'll be discussing how to detect CAD before it uh, strikes. Okay. Okay, all right, so, so we're going to begin with some basic truths. Uh, we all know that cardiovascular disease is now the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the Western world. We know global expenditures for cardiovascular disease are continue and are expected to continue to rise. And there's many factors for this, but two of them, of course, are an aging population and the fact that cardiac risk factors continue to increase in prevalence. And finally, we also know that prevention is a lot cheaper than trying to treat com complications of coronary disease. And it becomes a very important public health initiative to help identify people who have subclinical disease while they're still asymptomatic, to get them on the right treatments before we have to start treating all these patients with complications. So on that um, note, I was asked to discuss um, a little bit about the 2013 ACC AHA prevention guidelines. Uh, this was a series of three publications um, which were published um, in uh, JAK and circulation, really discussing how we can use, uh, how as physicians we can be guided on cardiovascular risk assessment, lipid management, and lifestyle changes. And hopefully through my talk, I will hit on some key features of um, these documents. So to begin with, let's begin with a case. Uh, this is a patient you may very well see every day in your clinics, a 59-year-old Hispanic female. She comes in, she's asymptomatic, um, and really comes in because she's concerned. She wants to make sure her heart is okay. And when you dig a little bit deeper, she doesn't really have any known history of coronary artery disease, but she's worried because her mother uh, was just a few years older than her before she had her first coronary event. Uh, turns out she's a lawyer, so she has a little bit of a stressful life. She doesn't smoke and really, you know, may live a kind of sedentary lifestyle, not paying too much attention to her diet or exercise. On physical exam, she's demonstrated to be hypertensive with a blood pressure of 145 over 80, and she's overweight, um, obese, uh, with a BMI of 30. Otherwise, her physical exam is normal. And on basic labs that we all get, you know, her sugars are okay. Her total cholesterol is 210, her HDL is 40, her LDL is 147, and triglycerides are 92. And I've given you her EKG here. And of course, as clinicians, she's coming to you to ask you what she should do. And if you're like me, there's probably several questions now running in through your head. You know, does she have coronary artery disease? How should I assess her cardiovascular risk? And then finally, what should I advise her? So, um, you know, in the, through, since 1960s, of course, we've learned a lot about cardiovascular disease, especially through studies, population studies, such as the Framingham study. This is another one of those population studies called the InterHeart that looked at about 30,000 patients over 52 countries. And what we realize is that cardiovascular risk factors are very important to a patient's risk. Things such as smoking, diabetes, hypertension, um, obesity, psychosocial stress, 
dyslipidemia are all associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease and the first myocardial infarction. On the other hand, activities such as exercise, um, um, moderate alcohol consumption, eating a diet lot rich in fruits and vegetables has shown to be cardioprotective and can prevent uh, and can and decrease your risk of, of a first cardiovascular event. We also know from these large population studies that as you pile on these risk factors in a given patient, their risk proportionately increases. So a very important point. So, you know, when I was looked, of course, when we see this patient in clinic, one of the very first things that we do is, of course, we talk about how we can reduce your risk factors, and we talk about how they can make, talk to our patients about how they can make changes in their lives. And the documents, these prevention guidelines actually give us a very good framework on how to do this. And you can look at the slides, and I'll let you read this on your own time, but I'll kind of summarize it for you. You know, of course, eating a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, keeping the sugars low, avoiding a diet high in saturated and trans fats is all very is beneficial to you. And of course, being more active, getting out, you know, exercising at least uh, four times a week of at least moderate intensity of exercise is recommended. Other advices we all probably give our patients is that in order to control risk factors is to limit our salt reduction because we know blood pressure is very important. And in fact, major trials have demonstrated to us that if we can get our blood pressures optimally controlled in the range of 120s, we can significantly impact survival. And then finally, if our patients are smokers, we advise them not to smoke. Um, um, the guidelines also make a lot of effort to help combat the increasing prevalence of uh, overweight and obesity. And again, uh, you know, these slides are there for you to look at, but the idea is, you know, do everything you can to recommend weight control and weight loss. But what else can we do for our patients? What else can I tell uh, other than what probably all of us do every day anyways? Well, one of the things that the guidelines strongly recommend is for us to get an idea of what the patient's 10-year risk of a cardiovascular event is. And that's using something called the pooled cohort equation. And this is just an equation that kind of gives you a quantitative idea of what their 10-year risk is. And the idea being is that you can then um, you know, match the intensity of your preventative efforts to the individual's patient's risks. So in general, if you were to find your, that your patient's 10-year risk is more than 7.5%, this is when you would get, um, um, you really uh, strongly consider um, optimal blood cholesterol management, and I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot about that in our next talk. Um, what is this pooled cohort equation? Well, the good, well, it's a, again a 10-year estimate of your patient's risk for non-fatal MI or coronary death or stroke. Um, it's derived from four very large co community-based cohort studies that bro broadly represent the U.S. population. And the good thing is all the components of it are readily available in a simple one clinic visit and include things like age, sex, blood pressure, basic lipid values, um, um, uh, and the like. And um, it is readily available on apps and all over the internet. All you have to type in is this ASCVD calculator and this screen will pop up. And so I did that for our patient. I punched in this patient's values um, as I had shown you and I got a risk of 4.9% for this patient's 10 year risk. So what do I do with this number now? Well, as you will, I'm sure, learn, um, this, uh, this patient, unfortunately, does not qualify for statin therapy based on our most recent guidelines. They have no known primary coronary artery disease. Their LDL is not greater than 190. They did not have diabetes. And generally, it's a class one recommendation if your score is greater than 7.5%. Our patient's score was 4.9%. So, and if you look at the guidelines, and I've starred where our patient sits, you can see it is not a class one recommendation at this time to consider statin therapy. But you know, does that make you sit comfortable about your patient? She's a patient who obviously has a lot of psychosocial stress. Uh, she doesn't have the best lifestyle. I know we'll give her advice for all of this, but her mother, remember she has a strong family history. Her mother had heart attacks in her low 60s. So, 
you know, the guidelines recognize this and they actually give us an out and they say in selected individuals, you can consider other factors to help you make treatment decisions. So what are these other factors? And these are a 2B recommendation. These other factors include a very elevated LDL greater than 160, a premature history of family, uh, a premature CAD like our patient, maybe if it's a young patient, a very elevated lifetime risk of ASCVD, and then maybe you can check novel risk factors, and these include things like a calcium score, ankle brachial index, or maybe an HSCRP level. So, you know, what are these novel risk factors? Well, you know, there's a whole table of them, and again, you have these slides to you, and they've all been associated with CAD. But the two I'd like to point out to you are the ankle brachial index and the calcium score, because both of these are recommended in both the ACCAHA guidelines as well as the 2016 European guidelines, because they actually are very strong predictors of risk because they identify subclinical atherosclerosis. But for the purposes of my talk, and I will hopefully drive this point through, is that I chose to really spend some time on calcium scoring because it is, after all, the strongest predictor of events, and I'll show you that. So what is a calcium score? Very simple test. We put our patients in a CT scanner. We look for calcium in the coronary arteries. This is an individualized test for your patient. If we detect calcium, there's no other disease this patient has other th that can do this other than coronary atherosclerosis. So you have made the diagnosis of CAD. Furthermore, the amount of calcium that you detect, it correlates with their total plaque burden. So it gives you a very good sense of how much disease these patients have. And did I mention this is a test that requires no contrast and no pins, needles, or IVs? So tell me a little bit about calcium scoring. Well, it's a very powerful prognostic study. We know that patients who have calcium scores of zero do very well with an excellent prognosis, whereas as their calcium score increases, you can see their risk proportionally increases. Whereas if you have a calcium score of, you know, on the range of 300 to 400, their risks are almost tenfold those of patients who are considered normal with a calcium score of zero. We know that if you use it in addition to your um, risk factors, it improves your discrimination using, uh, it increases the area under the curve or your able, ability to discriminate risk, and in this study, in multiple ethnic populations. And finally, we also know that it's a great test to help you uh, um, um, classify patients better. If you look at the black bars, those are patients where uh, um, risk stratification was done with calcium scoring. And what you'll notice is that the intermediate group now has le less patients in the intermediate group when you use calcium scoring. And the reason is because those patients are now being correctly, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, put into either a low or high category. And finally, we know based on other studies that compared to any novel risk factor out there, including CRP and ABIs and family history, that it is the best test for risk disc discrimination. So I did a calcium score on our patient, and this is what I got. I hope you'll see that, you know, there's all these red flecks in the coronary artery. That's the calcium. The, the computer quantitates a score for us. And this is actually a score that's moderately higher. Score greater than 400 is considered severe. So this patient had diffuse atherosclerosis. You have made the diagnosis that this patient has CAD, though it is she is asymptomatic. What we know from studies is that this is not in common. In those patients who are not considered for, recommended to have statin therapy, almost 20% will have calcium, whereas those patients where you can consider uh, calcium scoring, I mean, I'm sorry, consider statins, almost half will have a positive calcium score. And we know that those patients who have calcium from the same study will have worse prognosis, especially if their calcium scores are greater than 100. I, there are similar calculators then where you can take the uh, pooled cohort equation, modify it with the addition of your coronary artery calcium score. I did that on our patient, and you can see uh, with a calcium score of 360, our risk went from 4.9 to 9%, now meeting the criteria for statin therapy. And that's what I did. I put this patient on stand therapy with the hope that we will get um, 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 anticipated risk re reduction with this med group of medicines. 
Calcium scoring can be helpful in other ways. We know if you show this patient to the, this data to patients, they're more likely to comply with statin therapy. They're more likely to lose weight, and they're also more likely to stick to aspirin therapy. So it can be a very positive change behaviorally. Let me show you another case before I go. Uh, same patient, same risk factors. The only thing I changed was now I made this gentleman a male. We see this all the time. I calculated his risk. His risk comes out to be 10.6%. By the guidelines, it's simple. I need to put this patient on a statin therapy. It's guide class one recommendation. I spoke to this patient in great detail about the risks and benefits, and he was adamant. He refused. Uh, he's read all over the internet all the side effects of this drugs. His friends take it. They're not happy with this medicine. And I was in a little bit of a quandary, so I negotiated with him. I go, hey, look, with the idea that I told him, let me check a calcium score you know, it may positively change his behavior if he actually sees evidence of atherosclerosis. Here's his calcium score. I hope what you'll appreciate is that we, you didn't detect any of those red bright spots in the coronary arteries. This patient had no calcium, despite an elevated risk by the ASCVD score. Is that surprising? Well, it turns out that if you look in studies, in patients who are eligible for statins, that is patients who have an ASCVD score greater than 5%, almost one half of patients will have a calcium score of zero. And if you follow these patients out in the long run, it turns out they do very, very well. They do not have cardiovascular events. And in fact, if you look at their total risk, their risk is much less than the 5% where you would trigger a statin therapy. And in fact, when I put in uh, our patient, his profile with the addition of the calcium score zero, it reduced from 10% down to 2%, now no longer indicating that he needed a statin. And, in this and to take this one step further, we know from also other studies that the power of zero, a power of a zero calcium score, in this particular study, if you were low to immediate risk and you had a calcium score of zero, you had a less than 1% chance of a coronary event out to 15 years. So a warranty period of 15 years. And as a result, you know, I didn't give this patient that drug and we'll continue to follow him. And um, you know, um, he was obviously very happy about that as well. So um, you know, I have about one second left. I'll, I think I'll leave these uh, summary slides up for you in order for us to stay on track. Thank you.